ভুলে গেলাম মামা আমি কথা বলতে পারবো সেটা আমি একটা মিটিং করতে পারবো হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ আমার Welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. This is a series hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, along with the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're so glad to have all of you joining us here today. I'm Anthony Perillo. Shanti, your microphone is still muted. And what is Sam? I'm muted. There we go. Welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences along with the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Anthony Perillo, the Forensic Psychology Training Director in the Division of Forensic Behavioral Sciences here in the University of New Mexico's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. For our talk today, if you have any questions for our presenter, make sure you enter them in the Q&A box anytime you feel comfortable. Just know that we hold them to the end. We do try to get to as many as we can, but it's not always possible to get to all of them. If you are pursuing continuing medical education credits, there will be a sign-in sheet in the chat box shortly. And if you are pursuing APA continuing education credits, a link will be posted in around the last five minutes or so of the chat. Make sure you open the link, check the link before you uh, before you leave the webinar and then save your certificate after you complete the survey. We don't have access to the completed certificates after the fact. A recording link and PowerPoint slides should be available sometime later this week. And as a heads up for next week's talk in the series, we have Dr. Yosef Ben Porath, who will be overviewing the MMPI-3 in forensic evaluations. But let's get back to this week. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker who will be discussing working with interpreters in forensic evaluations. This is Dr. Jenny Chan. Uh, Dr. Jenny Chan is a clinical and forensic psychologist practicing in Atlanta, Georgia. She received her PhD in clinical psychology from the Graduate Center at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the City University of New York. Dr. Chan currently works as an inpatient psychologist on a forensic unit and routinely conducts forensic evaluations with adults that include competency to stand trial, mental state at the time of the offense, violence risk assessment, and civil commitment. She also has a private practice in which she conducts mitigation, immigration, and general clinical evaluations. She's been supervising psychiatry residents on psychotherapy for the past five years and has been involved in the Georgia Human Rights Clinic since around 2020, conducting asylum evaluations, consultation, and research. Uh, Dr. Chan, Jenny, uh, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, uh, it's an honor to have you joining us. I'm very excited and thankful for you sharing this helpful uh, information and your expertise with all of us today. Uh, I will go ahead and throw it over to you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, um, so thank you all for joining me today. Um, I'll be talking about um, working with interpreters and in psych psychological evaluations. So um, as Anthony mentioned earlier, I'm currently an inpatient psychologist at a forensic state hospital. Um, and I also have a private practice in which I do a wider range of evaluations. So through the years in my work, I have uh, worked with interpreters quite frequently. Um, so I have been reading up a little bit and I hope that you know, um, with the things I'm sharing today, it could be helpful for you in your clinical practice. Okay. Um, so this is for the CE credits. And I do not have any financial arrangement related to the content of today's presentation. 
um, and the views expressed in this presentation are mine and do not necessarily represent the views, policies, and positions of University of New Mexico. Okay. Um, so the learning objectives today are, you know, just discussing ethical and legal reasons for using interpreters, um, assessing at least three considerations, and hopefully uh, describing at least three guidelines for working effectively with interpreters. So um, the agenda for today's agenda, I am going to start off with a very quick look at language diversity in the United States, um, followed by requirements and guidelines that guide the use of interpreters. Um, the types of interpretation, some research about the current state and an ending with recommendations for working with interpreters. I will highlight some considerations related to site testing and forensic evals and really pass on some um, references that have been helpful for me. Okay, so first, um, English is the most common language spoken at home in the United States with roughly 78% of the US population speaking only English. So other than people who speak English at home, um, the US Census Bureau in the you know, American Community Survey um, asked participants, um, well, basically people who live in the US about um, spoken languages other than English in US homes. So as you can see here, um, the most common language that people are reported speaking at home is Spanish or Spanish Creole. Um, and the Hispanic population is the largest minority group in the United States, so it is not surprising that Spanish is the most common non-English language spoken in U.S. homes. And this is results from the 2019 survey. Okay. Um, other than Spanish or Spanish Creole, um, other common languages spoken at home includes Chinese, Tagalog, Vietnamese, and Arabic. Okay, so this figure shows the breakdown of H for the five most commonly spoken languages other than English. So as you can see in this figure, um, speakers of Spanish and Arabic, which is the first and fifth most common foreign languages spoken at home, had like the similar H compositions. Both languages had the greatest share of speakers who are younger, H five to 14, and a smaller share of speakers who are older. Um, and next, so amongst those who reported speaking a language other than English at home, they will also ask how well they thought they spoke English. So based on the same 2019 data, about 52% of people who spoke Chinese at home and 57% of those who spoke Vietnamese at home uh, reported speaking English less than very well. Um, and, you know, um, when they kind of describe the results, they said that this may have resulted from a recent increase in immigration from Asia and that the newcomers may not have had enough time to assimilate and master English yet. Okay. And this is like the last figure that I will be showing for today. Uh, but this map shows the distribution of people living in the various states uh, who reported speaking a language other than English at home. So as you can see, there are certain states, including California, Nevada, New Mexico, um, Texas, Florida, and New York, where there is a higher proportion of individuals who reported speaking a different language at home. So as you can see, you know, generally, um, the US does have uh, language diversity. All right, so moving into the legal requirements and policy guidelines, um, and the ones in bold are the legal requirements. So now this is a very quick, broad overview, and it's just to give some context um, of the importance of providing interpreter access. So we will start with the Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So Title VI um, is an executive order that was signed in 2000. It requires hospitals and providers who, if they take a certain federal funds, such as Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement, that these providers and hospitals have to take reasonable steps to ensure that people with limited English proficiency are able to have meaningful access to vital programs and services. So now this does not mean that you know everyone who takes Medicare or Medicaid will have to provide interpreter services. They have some factors um, kind of detailing you know who needs to uh, 
provide these services. So some of them include kind of like the, the patient population that you are serving, how frequent it is, and how if you have reasonable access to these languages. Uh, next, the 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act also uh, mentions, you know, um, providing qualified interpreters if you are serving this populations. And in there, they talk about how providers have to take reasonable steps to provide meaningful access to each individual with limited English proficiency if they are eligible to be served or likely to be encountered in its health programs and activities. Um, and then moving on to the Court Interpreters Act in 1978, an amendment. And now this is specific to court um, processes. Um, so the first one, Title VI and Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act relates to healthcare in general. And then the Court Interpreters Act, an amendment is for court pro uh, processes. So the Court Interpreters Act basically just kind of designated someone in the federal court system and said that, okay, you are in charge of setting up a program to kind of certify and um, have an exam for these interpreters to make sure that they are qualified and trained. So they also have a clause saying that, you know, if you are unable to find interpreters for rarer languages, you know, you can use otherwise qualified interpreters. And this can refer to interpreters who are, you know, um, certified in healthcare, but not uh, in the court system. But if you can't find anyone else who can go through this process, it's okay to use this otherwise qualified interpreters. Okay, and lastly, you know, I included in here the Office of Minority Health within the Health and Human Services. They have some guidelines. So if you are in charge of a program and you're looking to how to make your program more culturally and linguistically competent, you can refer to some of the guidelines that they have. Okay. Um, so that aside, uh, moving on. So as psychologists, we also have ethical guidelines that guide our practices. Um, so um, there are a couple of them that speaks directly to kind of interpreter use, and this is what I'm highlighting here now. So as psychologists, when we work with interpreters, we are expected to make sure that um, a few things. So first, that the interpreter doesn't know the evaluee socially, um, that the interpreters are trained, and that they are working in a manner competently. So we will cover a few points as to how to make sure that we're doing this towards the end of the presentation where I talk about recommendations. Um, some other ethical guidelines include that, you know, we should be using assessment methods that are appropriate to their language preference and competence. Um, and also, we also want to make sure that, you know, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to access like, you know, that specific language from that specific country in that dialect. Um, so, it, you know, the guidelines also kind of mention that, you know, in general, you know, these are things that we have to weigh and maybe sometimes it is better to offer some services, even if we can find like the perfect fit for the interpreter. Okay. So now I'm going to cover just very broadly about interpreter training, and this can be helpful for us to kind of consider, um, you know, um, how interpreters, um, how they are trained. Okay, so in general, in interpreting means that they are converting the meaning of the source language, and in the US, in this case, it's English, um, to the target language. Um, and one note that you know, some authors have mentioned is that interpreting does not mean translation. They are not the same thing. So translation really refers to like when you're translating written work, uh, whereas interpreting is used for like conversations and speeches. Um, so when we talk about what you know, is a qualified interpreter, that really just means that they are being trained. And there are a lot of formal training um, in the interpreter world. Um, you know, like in Georgia here, uh, some of the medical hospitals have their own program to kind of train and certify medical um, interpreters. So sometimes, you know, you see in the literature, they mention unqualified interpreters, and this refers to family members and bilingual staff. So I want to highlight here, and uh, you know, the bilingual staff here does not refer to bilingual evaluators who are proficient in another language and who do practice in that language. You know, bilingual staff here refers to just people working in the setting who may happen to speak a different language and sometimes they can get pulled in. Um, and really, they are, if they're not trained, they're considered unqualified. 
Um, so the main three areas in which uh, interpreters have like trainings and certifications that I've seen so far um, includes the medical field. And um, we wanted to highlight also that sometimes even if they are trained in the medical field, it does not necessarily mean they are trained in mental health. Um, a lot of the medical training are in like in the physical, the medical centers and may not include psychiatry. Um, and also another area in which interpreters are regularly kind of trained and certified in is in education, so um, in schools. And when they do like psychoeducation assessments. And lastly, as I mentioned earlier, um, the courts in the federal courts have um, their own programs for certification. And in Georgia, actually, you know, in 2003, um, the Supreme Court of Georgia also has a committee on uh, interpreters and they are responsible for certifying and training interpreters in the court system in Georgia. Okay. So moving um, to the types of interpretation. So there are different kinds of interpretation. Um, so the first one is what we call sequential or consecutive. And this happens when, you know, for example, if I'm the evaluator, I speak, the interpreter speaks, the respondent, then the interpreter, then me again. So everyone takes turn. There is a summary, a synoptic, and basically the interpreter do not kind of translate word for word or verbatim. They uh, just summarize what has been said. Um, there is also called the simultaneous uh, conference. And this, uh, you see it happen in like the big meetings, especially in United Nations type general assembly meetings, where there are a lot of people from different cultures and languages. So as soon as someone starts talking, the interpreter starts to interpret with just a few seconds of delay. Um, and then you have another a modified version of the simultaneous and that is whispering. Um, and you see that actually, you know, I see that sometimes when I run groups at a hospital and there are people um, in the group who speaks a different language. So they do like they interpret right after I start speaking and they, you know, hopefully whisper so as not to, you know, to maintain, um, make sure the group runs well. Okay, and there are two main modalities here that I want to highlight. So there is two uh, kinds of interpretation, main kinds of interpretation. One of them is called mechanical interpretation and that's when they do word for word translation or verbatim. The other one is what they call a constructionist or cultural broker approach, where in addition to kind of uh, interpreting it word for word, they actually translate the meaning and provide some cultural context into responses. Okay, so um, there are three main modes of interpretation that I'd like to cover today. The first one is face-to-face, -face, where you know, they are in the room with you together with the evaluate. And this is um, typically over, you know, people do recommend that this is the most desirable form of interpretation. The next most common form of interpretation is uh, by telephone. Um, and there are some advantages and disadvantages to using a telephone. So some of the disadvantage, you know, is a risk of distortion of communication, like of continuity. So every time you call the language line, they may give you a different person. Um, also, sometimes the audio quality is not good and this can be disruptive. Um, the advantage to using telephone interpretation services is sometimes you get access to rare languages and this can be very helpful, especially if you are in a location where you don't have access to all these different multicultural interpreters. Um, and then so also it's very helpful if you're in an inpatient setting and sometimes you need um, demands for interpretation outside normal working hours. And the last one, you know, is video conferencing. And this is something that we have seen more and more, especially after COVID. Um, so when you Skype with someone or you Zoom with a valuee, the interpreter is also a participant in video conferencing. Okay, now just a general kind of like uh, factors related to using interpreting services. So overall, uh, when you use interpreting services, it can actually reduce your overall cost and improve quality of care. Now, I know this sounds a little counterintuitive because we have to pay um, for interpreting services, but you know, there are research that shows that when you use a trained, well-qualified interpreter, you are likely able to make your diagnosis more accurately, which helps with your treatment recommendations. And in the long run, it really saves you money and time. <laughs> 
Um, and in general, you know, several authors have mentioned that using family members, friends are really strongly, strongly discouraged. And in fact, in the Affordable Care Act, they actually also have a stipulation that you should not be using family members, especially minor children. Um, for bilingual health staff, like uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, they may be able to interpret, uh, especially in emergency situations, but really, you know, they require a specialized training for the task. So overall, when we use an interpreter, you should expect an increase in time in a consultation. And on average, they have found that when you use an, evalu um, an interpreter, your consultation time increased between 20 and 38 minutes. And I, you know, this is consistent with my own experience. When I do an evaluation for every hour of evaluation, I would say there's an additional kind of 20 to 30 minutes that you, you want to factor in. Um, and, you know, authors have also kind of mentioned that interpreters really can provide cultural and contextual information, which can really help you understand what they're trying to say, uh, which can also have a very important bearing on the psychological issues being discussed. So um, some barriers to using interpreting services in our practice. So people have kind of reported anxiety with using interpreters, uh, some ambivalence about having someone else in the room with you and feeling scrutinized. And also sometimes, and especially with various languages, you know, um, people, we do have difficulties accessing some interpreting services. Okay, so now, you know, um, overall, we should be using trained and qualified interpreters, but of course, you know, as with most things in psychology, we have to kind of um, think about the reliability and validity concerns. So there are some really interesting research, actually, that kind of looked at how reliable um, uh, interpreters are, and, you know, I would like to share them with you today. Um, so to start off with, and this is a case um, that, you know, um, it's just interesting, so I thought I would just mention it and, and sad. So um, in 1980, um, Willie Ramirez was taken to a South Florida hospital in a coma. Um, and his family apparently used the word, and I don't speak Spanish, so I'm not going to say it right. Um, so they used the word intoxicado in Spanish um, to describe it, to describe Ramirez, right? So, um, and, you know, intoxicado in Spanish can just mean that you ingested something, right? So it could be that you ingested food. It could be that you ingested a drug. So it could be anything that makes you feel sick. So the family actually thought that Ramirez had eaten something which might have caused his symptoms, but the interpreter actually translated this word as intoxicated. So the doctor immediately made a diagnosis of drug overdose. And actually, so a couple of days later, the medical team actually figured out that his major problem was actually bleeding in his brain. But by then, you know, he had suffered lasting damage and he ended up being a quadriplegic, which is, you know, really sad. So this also just speaks to, you know, um, how important it is that we use um, well-qualified and trained interpreters. Okay, so um, there has, uh, you know, I'm just going to kind of discuss these studies all together, but these are really actually really interesting studies. So they have looked at, you know, um, interviews and they use like interviews with the interpreters and versus someone who speaks the language fluently and they kind of compare the results and they found that in general when you use an interpreter there is some omissions some additions and some substitutions right there so there is like some error to be expected however overall everyone really recommends that you use an experienced interpreter and that you use a qualified and trained interpreter So generally, um, you know, uh, some tips on advice and um, kind of improving our competence in working with interpreters. So first of all, we have to shift from a dyadic. So it's not just us and the evaluee, but it's us, the evaluee, and an interpreter. So it's like a triadic interaction. Um, and, you know, some authors have also mentioned a need for ongoing interactive training rather than a one-time didactic. So treat this as an introduction. Um, and the general rule here, you know, that people recommend is the interpreter is responsible for the language. So they choose how to, you know, interpret the terms and language, and we are responsible for the matter at issue. So, um, you know, as psychologists, as forensic evaluators, you are the one deciding what follow-up questions to ask. If you're using a test, you are the one also responsible for what test to choose. 
Um, and you know, some other research have shown that when we train professionals to work with interpreters, it increases their willingness to work alongside interpreters and vice versa. And uh, in general, you know, people do recommend that we think uh, more about how clear our speech is and thoughtfulness about using languages when we work with interpreters. So example, you know, you don't want to use like metaphors and figures of speech. So for example, asking things like, fly, do you fly off the handle, right? Are you the black sheep of the family? You want to be more direct. Um, and, um, you know, I have looked at the DSM-5 TR cultural formulation interview, and I do think that sometimes can be quite helpful in terms of helping me figure out, you know, how to frame some of my questions. So I do recommend that as a resource too. Okay, so before we kind of go into the recommendations about how to work with interpreters, I do want to go over this one study, which I thought was very um, interesting and insightful. Um, and this pertains to forensic evaluations. So um, the authors surveyed practices of forensic psychologists who has previously worked with and are working with people with Hispanic background um, in a forensic evaluation. So the two groups of uh, participants in here are, you know, sorry, they are, they are forensic psychologists. And then they talked about working with people with a Hispanic background who spoke English fluently and then uh, people with Hispanic background that has limited English proficiency. So around 60% of them said that they have worked with a trained certified interpreter, about 16% work with ad hoc interpreter, and that can be just someone from the office, the, the, um, you know, the attorney's office, so someone who is not trained. 72.3%, uh, most of them prefer sequential, which is when we take turns. Um, and then 61.7% prefer mechanical, which is the word for word verbatim translation um, interpretation. 37% um, reported reliance on an interpreter to administer psychological tests, and about 20% reported ad hoc translation of English language test. So the findings that are relevant to um, our topic today is that um, the authors found it concerning that you know the use of ad hoc interpreters, you know, um, which is not which is really discouraged, and also ad hoc translation of English language tests, and that means translated on the spot. So just kind of like giving the BDI to like the interpreter and like, you know, translate it on the spot. And this is what um, the authors really caution against. Um, another thing that they found was actually helpful was to have the constructionist inputs. And remember, this is when the interpreter is able to give you some cultural information as background to contextualize, contextualize responses. So, um, I, you know, like I say, a, a lot of authors have, you know, provided a lot of really good recommendations based on like research um, and their experiences. And I've put together what people are saying. Um, so, like a rough guideline to how to work with interpreters. So, first, you know, you want to assess the need for interpreter. Second, how to select the right interpreter. Um, third, to have a pre session with the interpreter, then the interview with the interpreter, and then the post session. So the very first step to assess a need for interpreters, um, you know, before all of this, I would just like to say that, you know, obviously the first choice that we can do, if you are able to, is to refer out to someone. However, that is just sometimes not possible because of accessibility or just not possible because of the setting you're in. So when that happens, um, then, you know, you can assess if you are able to do it with an interpreter. So when we assess the need for interpreters, the first thing you want to ask is the clients is their reported preference. Um, so sometimes they will tell you, okay, you know, I'm comfortable in speaking English or I want an interpreter. So now for um, evaluators who report that they are comfortable in English, I do recommend that we, um, you know, have put in some thought about it too. You know, I have had evaluators who tell me they are comfortable and they want to speak to me in English. However, you know, their proficiency when I kind of ask them, um, you know, open-ended questions or ask them to kind of uh, give me more information, they are really, and I see them really struggling, trying to have, you know, give me like a good story with enough details and information. So in that case, even if the, inter uh, if, even if the evaluee says that they want to speak to you in English, it may be better to have an interpreter anyway. <laughs> 
Okay, so the next thing about selecting the right interpreter. So within a mental health context, we always want to aim to use the client's first language and an interpreter who speaks the language ideally from the same country and same dialect. Now, this is very ideal, um, you know, and we want to be pragmatic about things, but I know we do want to aim to use their first language if possible. And one example that I can, I know I'm thinking about is, um, there are countries where people are from where you know people are most most fu functionally bilingual. So, for example, like you know in Hong Kong, um, you know people speak Cantonese and Mandarin Chinese. So, however, a lot of them, you know, their first language is Cantonese, which is very different from Mandarin Chinese. So, although they may say that, oh yeah, I I can speak both languages. Um, however, sometimes people are just not able to use like the same kind of nuance to explain themselves or have the same repertoire of vocabulary, which can really affect, you know, our evaluation of them. Okay. Um, the next thing we want to consider is to match gender, age, religion, especially for sensitive topics. And this includes things of, you know, like a sexual nature or things um, that includes like torture or sexual assault and violence. Um, so, Sometimes there are certain cultures where people may feel more comfortable sharing, um, you know, these more personal experiences with someone of the same gender. And this does not mean that you cannot use an interpreter of a different gender. It's just for you to consider. Uh, I have seen like, very well-trained um, interpreters who have been able to like, you know, work with um, evaluees of a different gender and, you know, because they are really well-trained, they're just very good at what they're doing. So it's just kind of like, you know, um, things to consider about. Okay, um, and we also want to make sure that they, well, if we can, that the interpreter have a cultural competence um, and its awareness of cultural norms and sensitivities. And sometimes, you know, you can speak a language, but not be, not be from that country. Or you, you know, they were born and actually raised in the US, but they speak another language fluently. So just to have an idea, um, you know, if the interpreter does also have the additional cultural competent knowledge. Um, it's also recommended to have the same interpreter throughout if possible. And ideally, um, the interpreter should have experience in mental health. Okay. Um, and I want to quickly, you know, just give a couple of case examples uh, to kind of illuminate the things that we have been talking about. So um, there's an individual who was committed to a psychiatric facility um, for reasons related to the legal system. You know, they actually uh, were here for the whole process, competency, the sent trial, criminal responsibility, evaluation, and civil commitment. So um, the individual reported discomfort with the interpreter because they were from the same ethnic group and community. Um, and you know, they are from the same small ethnic group in the community. And the interpreter actually was probably like the one and only interpreter that speak that specific language from that country and ethnic group. So um, yeah, so it, it was hard, right? So that was the only interpreter that was available. Um, so the individual actually, you know, reported a lot of concerns because um, the individual was at a hospital for um, a homicide related to someone in the ethnic group. So it was big news in the ethnic group. And then the individual uh, reported some paranoia that wasn't sure if it's a uh, real, just, you know, um, distrust or like delusional type of paranoia related to the interpreter. So these are just some, you know, considerations that we have. So I wasn't personally involved in this case at that stage, uh, but what I heard in the end was that, you know, they, um, this individual wanted to speak with the evaluator in English. However, they, their proficiency was just not to the level that would be, you know, they just wasn't proficient in English to the extent. So they did end up having the interpreter and then just uh, making sure and sharing that, okay, you know, uh, confidentiality is being uh, maintained and, you know, making sure that, you know, that's the best that they can do. Okay. Um, and also, I think I mentioned earlier about interviews with potentially embarrassing or sensitive sexual content. Um, and if they are kind of uncomfortable with a certain interpreter, try and see if you can um, get a different interpreter. Okay, now. Um, the pre-session. So um, most of the authors really do recommend having a pre-session pre with the interpreter. And I have 
personally found this to be extremely helpful too. So they do recommend speaking with the interpreter about 10 to 15 minutes before the interview. And the goal here really is to build a working alliance. Right. So during this pre-session meeting, you want to clarify the purpose of the meeting and briefly describe the plan. You don't have to tell them every single question you're going to ask, but just in general. So for example, um, you know, when I do immig immigration evals and asylum evaluations, I do let the interpreter know that you know, there may be topics related to torture, assault, and just to give them a heads up that this will be happening. And then you also want to clarify specialist vocabulary. And this means that, you know, for example, if you are doing a competency to stand trial evaluation, that the interpreter is familiar with court legal terms. Um, or, you know, if you're doing mental health evaluation, that they are familiar with like mental health terms. Um, you also want to remind the interpreter to speak in the first person. So the interpreter shouldn't be saying, oh, he said this, or she said this, or they said that. Uh, it should be, you know, um, I. They should be speaking as if they are, you know, um, the, the evaluee. Um, and most authors do recommend that we tell the interpreters to do a verbatim word for word interpretations. And this is especially important in, in mental health and psychiatry, especially as you know, for, like, for certain things like thought disorders. Um, it's also recommended to ask for the correct pronunciation of the evaluee's name to promote a rapport and respect. And you also want to, again, verify confidentiality and that the interpreter does not know the client socially. Um, so there are several kind of case examples, and I have seen this personally in my experience too. Um, when you are with an evaluee and they have um, thought this organization as their primary presenting symptom and the interpreter is kind of stuck during the interview and they say, oh, you know, I don't know, um, they are speaking nonsense. Or, I, I don't understand they're speaking nonsense. So when, if and when the interpreter does say that, first of all, you want to clarify and first of all, you want to try and tell the interpreter to, okay, you know, I know it can be hard, uh, but just can you translate word for word or verbatim? And um, an additional kind of like tangential note here is that interpreters, when they are trained, they are trained to make meaning, right? So their goal is not really to like uh, translate things word for word because, you know, across languages, it's very hard to find like, you know, equivalent word in languages. So really how they are trained is that they are supposed to make meaning as closest to the meaning of the source language. So sometimes, you know, you can see them really struggling if they're not used to working with people with thought this organization. But I have found that just telling the interpreter, hey, you know, I know it may not make sense to you, but just say verbatim what um, the individual is saying, and that can be very helpful. Okay, so now during the interview process, so you want to be looking at and speaking directly to the patient. Um, if the conversation drifts into a sidebar, uh, and it will, uh, politely request that the site conversation be shared. So this will happen, you know, I think it happens very frequently. Um, so it doesn't, you know, it's okay. Uh, but, you know, when that happens, you want to make sure that the interpreter is kind of keeping you in the loop. And uh, in my experience, when I work with really well-trained interpreters, they will like, let you know what's happening. So they will say that, oh, you know, client is asking for clarification on this. I'm explaining the same thing. Um, if the interpreter doesn't share that with you, feel free to kind of um, ask that, hey, you know, it's very important for me to know exactly um, and everything that the individual says. So please let me know what the individual is saying. You want to try and keep your questions short. Um, don't try to have like a runoff long sentence. You want to try and avoid compound and multiple questions. You also want to try and develop like a conversational rhythm. So I would say like a short conversation. Um, and if you would like to speak with the interpreter or if the interpreter would want to speak directly to each other, you know, you want to make sure everyone is in the loop. So for example, you know, if I want to speak to the interpreter and I will say, hey, uh, I would like to speak with the interpreter, I have a clarification, and then the interpreter will let the client know that I'm speaking with the interpreter. Um, and you know, in my experience, when the really well-trained interpreters, when they are trying to say something and not interpreting, they usually preface uh, what they're saying with interpreter would like to say. And I found it to be very helpful.
um, and in the post session. So this is also a, a very uh, um, widely recommended kind of um, phase in like when we uh, work with interpreters. So it is recommended. Um, and they do recommend like an open-ended query, um, you know, just in general ask the interpreter, how has it been? So, I mean, you know, just think of it as like a debrief when you have with like trainees or someone else who's sitting in a conversation and just ask them how they're doing. Um, and this is also a very helpful time to seek clarification about cultural or historical content. So for example, if they say something that you don't really quite understand um, related to like the way of living or like schooling um, in that country, if the interpreter has experience and is from the same country, you know, it, uh, it can be very helpful. So it's also a good time to review unusual or incorrect responses with the interpreter. Um, so if you know the evaluee mentioned something that seems a little unusual to you and you're not quite sure if it's a, like, you know, like a culturally appropriate response or is it something that is, you know, veering to a psychosis, this is a great time to ask the interpreter. And, and I will share an example that I had. Um, I was doing an immigration evaluation and the, um, the evaluee reported to me that, um, they, their mother passed away recently and they were starting to feel sick because they could feel her spirit coming through them and like visiting them. So when I asked him, you know, um, the, the, the evaluator said they weren't like disturbed by it or anything, but then they said that they felt weak. So when I kind of clarified with the interpreter, the interpreter did tell me that, oh, this is actually a common cultural response that, you know, um, if someone who is um, recently departed or deceased, they often go back and visit the family and close people, and then um, they will pass through them and that they may feel sick. But you know, it's nothing concerning in the sense of like psychosis or anything. It's just like a culturally appropriate response. And that was very helpful to me. Um, and lastly, you know, it's also a good time to clarify about the evaluee's language fluency, any dialects or any idiosyncrasies. So remember that the interpreter is the expert in the language. So if there's anything kind of odd in like syntax or prosody, um, usually you can ask the interpreter. Um, okay, so I would like to um, you know, share with everyone like a case example um, of a competency descent trial evaluation. So this occurred during a competency descent trial evaluation with a defendant who was from a Southeast Asian country with no formal education. And they moved to the United States um, in their late 30s, 40s. So when asked about the role of a judge, the defendant responded, I think the judge loves me, right? So then it was very helpful in this case because um, the interpreter actually provided cultural information to kind of contextualize this response. Um, the interpreter said that the love that is being used in this manner did not refer to romantic love or religious love. It was used to indicate that the people were not enemies of one another. And to provide further context, this um, defendant came from a country where um, there is a lot of conflict and war between ethnic groups. So as you can see, you know, this is an important term and useful term that you know, um, she um, grew up with and um, that, you know, that they use. Okay, so um, I have one slide on psychological testing, which is not enough, but this is really just to give a quick overview and I have resources and references that hopefully will be helpful to people that they can uh, read up on. So in general, I would say that um, most of the authors do say that concurrent ad hoc translation of test content is strongly discouraged. So you don't want the interpreter to be interpreting it translating the thing as you go during the session. If needed, um, you know, Weiss and Rosenfeld do recommend that they can prep beforehand in accordance with the internal, International Test Commission guidelines for translating and adapting tests. Um, and, you know, people also do recommend that you always refer to the manual. Some of the manuals do talk about the use of interpreters, not all do. So, you know, uh, some, um, some examples that the authors gave was the SIRS2 actually explicitly discouraged the use of interpreters. And the SIRS2 actually does have a Spanish language version using English norms. And I, you know, from my quick Google search, they also actually have a Chinese version that is validated with my Chinese speaking population. 
So, you know, if you're working with clients from there, you do want to use that um, version instead. Um, and, you know, I also like to highlight the use of the MOCA here. So the MOCA is one of the tests that actually, you know, has been translated by the publisher uh, themselves um, and translated over like nearly a hundred languages. I think the last I checked on their website. So they have a lot of languages that's available on there. Um, and some of the tests too, they are also like culturally validated where they actually have norms from that country. So this may be a quick one to do. Okay. Um, so for forensic evaluations too, you know, um, our specialty guidelines do say that, you know, when we use assessment methods, we want to make sure that they're appropriate to the examinee's language preference and competence. So we really do want to keep that in mind. Um, and also I would just highlight something here that typically when we request for interpreters in a psychological evaluation, um, this is seen by the, uh, the interpretation companies, the language companies as a medical encounter. So typically, you know, you'll get someone who is trained in a medical setting. Um, now, obviously, depending on your setting and the access that you have, you can ask and see if people are trained in, you know, um, psych, uh, mental health um, or have experience working with people with mental health. And uh, sometimes they also don't have like, you know, because they're not court certified, like I say, you know, psychology evaluations is seen as a medical encounter. Um, so we usually do not get anyone who's court certified. Not that I've seen. Um, and I have included some references. This is not an exhaustive list, but these authors have you know, done really good work. Um, and if you are interested in forensic evaluations, uh, please refer to these references. Okay, some last things to be aware of. So um, you know, in your report, you should always, always document if an interpreter was involved in the interview. Um, and this is something that you know, an author has recommended um, I personally have not done this yet, but you know, it's just um, food for thought. So I know um, they recommend quoting the evaluee in their native language for issues that are culturally laden or fundamental to answering the referral question. Um, and I think you know, I one of the uh, textbooks, you know, they mentioned that um, in court sometimes the interpreters, uh, depending on which side they're on, can argue about how to interpret certain terms. So sometimes I can see why that can be helpful if you are trying to assess intent, right? And then um, it may be helpful to have like the native language in there. So however, I think in that case, you would have to ask the interpreter for help in writing it down. Okay, um, another thing is, you know, humor, irony, sarcasm does not translate well. So they generally recommend that you do not use any of these in your evaluations. Um, overall, when you use an, uh, an interpreter, there will be some loss of control in the interview. Um, for example, when like sidebar happens. So in those cases, um, the, the recommendation is that, you know, we still have the overall structure, but we do want to allow some flexibility. So, you know, when they're having that sidebar, you don't just like cut it off right away, you know, let them have their sidebar and then you, want, and then you can request like, okay, you know, let's get everyone in the loop. Um, and, you know, if you have access to this resource, that's very good. So if, and I think this also happens more in settings where you have access to like the same interpreter. So um, you want to consult with a knowledgeable bilingual professional who can evaluate a potential interpreter skills. Um, and one last thing that, you know, I would like to highlight is sometimes, you know, if you are in an evaluation and you're not quite sure if the interpreter, um, is it like the evaluate is you know um, acutely ill right now, or is it the interpreter not doing um, the best job interpreting? So in those cases, um, you know one of the ways the author has kind of recommended is if you find that there is a persistent pattern of vague, tangential, interpreted responses to specific questions, you know that may be an indication that maybe you want to try another interpreter. So for example, you're, if you're asking about like drug use and you ask it in like five different ways and you still don't get a straight answer, um, then you want to you know maybe try a different interpreter. And I would say you know um, language in general, like like people have higher receptive language, so like understanding and hearing compared to productive language, so like you know being able to speak.
So a lot of the um, individuals that you know I work with, sometimes they may understand more than they can uh, produce, which is how language is. So I have had occasions in which the evaluee is noticing that they are not their responses are not being interpreted well and they start trying to speak in English. So that's also like an indication that, okay, maybe something here is going on with the interpreter. Um, and all right, I think that is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank my friends and colleagues for sharing their experiences and knowledge with me. And I don't know if there's anyone has any questions about anything. Thank you so much, Jenny, for uh, for covering so much here in thinking about how we can use interpreters and like really, really highlighting how much of this also comes before you're actually in the interview um, and, and doing getting ready for the evaluation and everything that happens after that, too, that it's not just in the evaluation, the before and the after and how vital that is to um, to using interpreters effectively. Um, the, the links for surveys are in the chat box, uh, so make sure that those, those work for you. If you have any questions for, for Jenny, Dr. Chan here, um, we, have, we have several of them already. I'll go ahead and through them, but feel free to enter some in the Q&A box if you have any additional questions, uh, any additional questions for her. Um, so Jenny, so one thing you had referenced here is the, the amount of extra time that can happen, um, you know, up to 30, 40 minutes on the hour you had mentioned. And somebody said that they had found their clinical forensic interviewers interviews through interpreters were taking twice as long um, and said, do you have any suggestions for reducing the length of the interview without compromising the integrity of the interview? Oh, yeah. I, you know, I think in general, if you have the able to have the pre-session to prep the interpreter that can really help save time. And, you know, one other thing that I've noticed too is having a good trained interpreter makes a world of difference. Now, this is like, you know, it's just very hard to kind of, you know, ensure that. But whenever I see an interpreter that I work with who is really good, I make sure to tell like the attorneys and the hospital staff that, you know, if you can request for them again, but I think sometimes it is hard and um, just being able to prep the interpreter can help to save time. Thank you for that. Um, someone wanted to know if you could speak to how to help interpreters detecting things like thought blocking, clang associations, other like linguistically specific presentations of speech disorganization that you know the, the clinician might not be aware of if they're culturally and linguistically bound yeah. presentations. Right. Oh, mm. that's a really good question. Um, I think for thought blocking, you know, as clinicians, we can probably observe that too. And maybe one thing that I would want to clarify with the interpreter is like the pause in responses. Is that kind of normally seen in your culture? Uh, is this something that is a little bit odd, even like, you know, in your cultural like, encounters? For clang, oh, those, those are hard because like you said, it's very linguistic. So in those cases, and you know, the authors do recommend that you ask the interpreter to do verbatim word for word translation. And you know, if you want to clarify, if you have some kind of inkling or suspicion, you can ask the um, you know, interpreter like, hey, you know, um, does this sound like the same? Is it kind of odd? Um, you can ask them to describe the language. You know, I've uh, asked interpreters to kind of ex like describe like their vocabulary, you know, like is it odd? And then sometimes they tell me that, oh yeah, they speak like they are, you know, like a great school kid or like they speak like, you know, um, in like a different, like the prosody and the tone is weird. So that has been helpful too. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, some people asked specifically about how this translates to using interpreters for sign language. And someone, someone also said that they recently had their first experience and that it felt very different than working with a speaking interpreter. And if you had any tips or strategies for working with, uh, with sign language interpreters. Yeah, so you know, I actually did not include sign language in here too because it, I feel like it's like a whole other specialty topic um, that you know people who work with deaf people and who work with ASL can better speak to that. But you know, I would say that in general, yeah, sign language can be tricky. Um, and just, I think in general, the same kind of like um, recommendations and I will look to like other more renowned uh, sources, people who work with that more for specific recommendations. But from my end, you know, just I think prepping the um, interpreter, also making sure that they are speaking like the same sign language. So like it's American sign language or is it Australian sign language, you know, from different countries. 
Um, I think one time, you know, we had someone at the hospital who had to use like two sign languages because they were interpreting from a different sign language from a different country, and then the sign language to the American sign language, and then American sign language to like the evaluator. Um, yeah. Sounds like quite a lot of documentation and post yeah. and post interview prep and all that too that would go into that. Yeah. Um, someone asked, you know, regarding administering something like the, the MOCA in another language, would you have the interpreter read the instructions in the client's language? Yes, I, and I think that's uh, what the, um, the website does say. Um, and, you know, also, um, you know, I think in general, they have recommendations about the types of tests uh, better for like interpreter to administer versus some things that are not really um, you know, like the says to it, you know, you want to make sure that it's very involved and like the tone, we want to make sure we are neutral. Um, however, for the mocha, things that are shorter, um, you can ask the interpreter to go through. So with those things, I would include that in the pre-session to go over it with the interpreter and just kind of tell them what the expectations are. Kind of going along those lines, can, can you talk a little bit about um, some other risks or concerns about having interpreters with the psych testing? It's, it was mentioned in one survey that over 30% of forensic psychologists use interpreters for testing itself. Um, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, you know, and uh, um, I also have used interpreters with like questionnaires before. And I, for example, you know, um, when I do immigration evals and I'm trying to assess like traumatic um, disorders. So there are some uh, questionnaires that already translated. So first of all, I would definitely not have the interpreter translated on the spot. So not, so if they were to administer something, it would be something that's already translated. Um, so they can read it to them. Um, and sometimes I do like a quick Google search to see if people have done that and if it's okay. Um, but, you know, I think this is where we want to kind of balance, right? Like um, as much as we can get from like the clinical interview, if you feel like you need something a little bit more um, and, you know, if people in the field have kind of done it before with people from that country, then, you know, this kind of helps bolster your, you know, uh, reliability and validity of using that. Uh, but yeah, you know, that, that is a very like long um, topic, which is why I only have one slide. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of references on that and those authors are, you know, have very good thoughts about it. I think um, in general, they do say that, you know, you just want to make sure first of all, that you're not translating it on the spot. Um, and that when you use it, it should be things that are like quick and easy and not something that is like very involved. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, Several people brought up the idea of technology or AI, and we're curious if you were aware of any development in which AI has been used as a way to uh, provide interpretation services or pros and cons of using, say, devices that automatically translate uh, compared to in-person or telephone interpreters. Right. So, you know, when I did uh, my research for this um, presentation, I actually did not come across any AI things. So if people are interested, you should look into that. Um, I, so I don't have any, like, you know, good thoughts about that. But I would just say on an anecdotal level, um, so I do speak a, 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 another language. And then I have used, like, Google Translate before. And I would say, like, the hit rate for that is, the, you know, it's, it's not the most accurate and I, especially for like clinical things, right? Sometimes there's like nuance to different things. Uh, it, yeah, so I think um, depending on, like it is again, depends on your context. If you're doing a forensic evaluation, I should, I would probably not do that until like people have done research or if you like buy some proprietary, proprietary like things that they have like, you know, uh, research on. Uh, but if you're, if you're in an emergency situation, you know, and you just want to know, like, okay, like, is this person psychotic or not um, at the hospital, you know, maybe you can use it as an aid. But if you're in a hospital, also, hopefully, then you have access to a language line. So that is recommended at this time. Wonderful. Um, some people have highlighted, it sounds like having cultural competency is important, even if you use an interpreter. Thank you for reviewing examples of this. Um, and, and somebody asked, how hard is it to get an interpreter that is bicultural? Uh, the education level of the patient may have a great impact on how they speak and understand what is being asked. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry. So the question was how easy it is to find an interpreter who is bicultural. Is that correct? 
Right. And, you know, uh, interestingly, this is, uh, you know, it's very helpful if you look at the uh, American Community Survey, because you can see uh, the distribution of people who speak um, the language. So I think it really differs, and also it differs in your setting. So in Atlanta here, we actually, you know, are one of the largest refugee resettlement program here in Georgia. So we actually have access to a lot of, like, you know, diverse range of languages and people from that country. So it has been helpful. So I am not as familiar with other places and I would think it really kind of depends on your community. So even if you can't find someone who's bicultural, um, just having a language and making sure that we understand them as they are trying to explain to you how they are themselves, you know, is the way to go. And I think overall, you know, just being reasonable because even the legal requirements, right? You know, the, the, the language in there is always reasonable accommodations. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan Jenny. Um, for for very helpful information in the in the before, during, and after parts. Um, if we come across um, the need to use interpreters in our in our forensic evaluations, um, it's been a, it's been a great help. Um, and I'll also make sure that you know that you know you have people from the DBHDD in there saying way to represent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that that wraps up this week's law and mental health series. Uh, next week we have Dr. Yosef Ben Porath who will be uh, overviewing the MMPI three and forensic evaluations. So we hope to see you again, and until next time, take care. Thank y'all. Yeah.